Good morning, party people, and it really is morning. I know a lot of the times when I come out here and I do morning sunrise type questions and answers, uh, you, the sun has already risen and so you can't really see the sunrise. Today you will be able to see the sunrise. We're in Cabo San Lucas. It's about 6.30 a.m. local time. And uh, let's go through some of your SQL Server questions. You won't be able to see me, but you know, well, I mean, maybe you can see me if you zoom in real close. Uh, first question is from Radic. Radic asks, hi Brent, do you know a person who's doing exactly what you do, but for production DBAs, not the performance tuning folks? I can't find up-to-date sessions and courses dedicated to production DBAs that cover that part of the job. So it's tricky. I, I used to do that and I stopped doing it um, because I think that there's, um, what's the Bare Naked Ladies song, It's All Been Done? I, I think that if for the most part, the production DBA courses that were out 10 years ago are still relevant today. A lot of production work hasn't changed. The parts that have uh, involve specific tools like DBA tools, the PowerShell framework. Um, so rather than trying to find, oh, and the other thing is that the cloud changes everything, that the cloud, when you work in the cloud, the vendor that you're on and the way you choose to run your VMs changes everything. It doesn't make financial sense for trainers to try to build one production DBA course that's relevant to everybody who's on on-premises bare metal, on-premises VMs, AWS EC2, Azure VM instances, uh, Google Compute Engine, Azure SQL DB, you know, you just can't build one course that goes across all those. So what you want to look at instead are courses that help you address specific tasks rather than thinking you're just going to get one course that covers everything a production DBA does because it's just so different at every shop. Um, next up, Arnold asks, what are the top causes of data corruption in SQL Server? Um, you know, I don't have any like empirical data that I could really answer that in terms of the top causes, but I'll tell you, and, and really it doesn't really matter what the causes are because you can't stop them. For example, storage is corruption is going to happen. SQL Server bugs are going to happen. The most recent SQL Server 2019 cumulative update, CU15, just fixed yet another corruption issue that's built into the SQL Server code. Uh, so rather than thinking about what the top causes are, think about how are you going to react when they strike. And that involves doing database restores, you doing check DB so that you know your restores are going to be good, scripting those restores ahead of time with tools like SP Database Restore uh, so that you can react as quickly as possible when they strike. Or of course, use features built into the SQL Server engine, database mirroring, always on availability groups that get you automatic page repair too. Next up, uh, Marcus the German says, Hi Brent, a friend of mine wants to know if it's possible to tell which page is on which data file. He says, I have a, a database with multiple data files. Yes, there's. Uh, if you watch my How to Think Like the Engine class, you start to get into a little bit about how pages are stored. Um, I don't go into the internals in any of my classes because there's no action you can take with that information. There's nothing where you can go, oh, this specific row lives on this specific page on this specific file. I guess I better make that file fast. Because the problem is if you have multiple data files inside the same file group, every time you do an index rebuild, those rows are gonna shuffle. They're gonna move from one place to another. Uh, so the, the thing that I would step back and ask is, what's the problem that you're trying to solve with that? It's doable. You can look at things like SysDMDB page allocations, but what's the problem you're trying to solve? Because as soon as somebody does an index rebuild, assuming you have multiple files in the same file group, the data can move from one file group to another. Next up, Hamid asks, what are the pros and cons of putting the first responder kit and SP who is active in the master database as opposed to some kind of dedicated database, DBA database. The big advantage with having them in master is that you can call them from any database and they'll work. 
you can just type in SP Blitz index and you can get index advice in the database you're in as opposed to saying exec uh, dba tools dot dbo dot sp blitz index and there are some things that you can only do in master i'll give you an example in sp blitz index we show you the database statistics or i'm showing you the table statistics for the table that you're looking at well the only way that we could get that to work is when you run sp blitz index in the database where the statistics are at. That works when the, when the thing is in master. It doesn't work when the, the SP Blitz index is in another database because of uh, the way that the statistics DMV works, the histogram DMV, it's like SysDMDB stats histogram. Uh, it only works in the current database. It doesn't support cross database queries. So that's one example off the top of my head as to why I just put them in master and call it a day. Uh, Hilal asks, what are the risks of killing the SPID associated with a long-running transaction? Is terminating the offending app any better? Well, the risk is, is that when you kill a query, rollbacks are single-threaded. Uh, rolling work forward is multi-threaded. Rolling work backwards is, is single-threaded. So when you kill a query, let's just say for the sake of simplicity, that was using eight cores for one hour straight, and you kill it, well, it could take eight hours to roll back or longer. And there's not really an easy way to predict how long the rollback is gonna take until after you've started killing the query. Um, so the reason why terminating the offending app is usually better is very often when you quit an application, the developers have built some kind of thing into their connection resets that will either commit a transaction, any transactions that are outstanding, or it'll roll them back. If their app has, when you close the transaction, or close the app, if there are any uh, outstanding transactions, go ahead and commit them, then you don't lose your work and it takes effect instantly which is awesome. If they have some kind of thing where it says, we're gonna roll it back, oh, look at that camera adjusted to me now. Uh, if it says, if there are any transactions, we're gonna roll them back, well then, uh, it's not your fault if the thing takes forever in order to roll back. <laughs> it's their problem instead of yours. Uh, next up, Miko asks, hi Brent, I think SP Blitz First is reporting forwarded fetches a second are high for temp tables. How do we find the offending jobs or store procedures? So the problem, SQL Server tracks forwarded fetches, uh, but it doesn't tell you which objects they're on in real time. What you have to do is look at SP Blitz Index. SP Blitz Index will tell you which uh, objects have high forwarded fetches per second. It doesn't work for temp tables though, because temp tables are constantly created and dropping, created and dropped. SQL Server loses all of that information immediately. So what you could do is you could look to see which queries are running during that time span and then go sort them by rights. For example, SP Blitz Cache has, this is SP Blitz Cache, not SP Blitz First. SP Blitz Cache has a sort order for rights. So you can see which objects are doing the most rights. You can also use that in combination with the minutes back parameter. You can say, SP Blitz Cache, show me the queries that have done the most writes in the last minutes back 15 minutes, just to say. Minutes back filters for queries that have executed in the last 15 minutes. However, the writes are cumulative since that object went into cache. Uh, so hopefully that gets you started there. Next up, Mark asks, Hi Brent, what are the pros and cons of running two SQL instances on the same bare metal hardware? First and foremost, it makes troubleshooting a whole lot harder. It makes it way harder to figure out when you think your instance is slow. You don't know whether it's slow because of something that's happening on your instance or something that's happening on another instance that's killing performance. 
Um, the next thing that's a little tricky is patching. You have to get the business owners and stakeholders of both of those SQL Server instances to agree on a date and time that works well for Windows patching. Uh, and then you can have patches go wrong that you'd like to be able to roll back, and unfortunately you can have issues that affect both instances. So those are the quick and easy starting points. Security is, of course, also a concern. Um, next up, Preben says, Hi Brent, have you ever used delayed durability to significantly reduce write log weights? Yes. Are there any, so yes, that's the first one. Second, he says, are there any undocumented issues with it? Not undocumented, but documented. Delayed durability can and will lose data even during a graceful shutdown, even during a planned shutdown, even during a planned failover. You, there's nothing built into SQL Server that ensures every delayed durability write makes it to the transaction log file. And this is in delayed durability's documentation in books online. Um, so there's a stored procedure you can call which will flush all of the stuff to disk. You just don't get that luxury during a, a failover, a cluster failover. Even when someone does a planned failover for things like patching, they just don't usually remember that they have to call that stored procedure. And there's no way that I can call code when SQL Server shuts down. There's nothing built in that will let me accomplish that. So that's the biggest one is it, you really can lose data even when you plan that outage. And then last off, we'll do, I don't, want a D, uh, I don't want a DBA today asks, I want to set up a read-only SQL server to run reports since we're currently crushing our production server. We have 2016 standard and we're looking at the best option, be it always on availability groups versus replication. Well, there's an easy answer there. Basic always on availability groups, which is what you get in standard, do not support readable replicas. <coughs> Excuse me don't support readable replicas. So game over there. Um, your options include things like log shipping, uh, replication, or doing your own ETL with things like SSIS or Azure Data Factory to move a copy of the tables off somewhere else. All right, well, the sun is rising now. You see all the uh, the fishing boats that are heading out there going out to sea today. You'll, you'll, uh, let's see here if I can get the, the tracking to stop looking at me. There we go. Fishing boats that are headed out to sea this morning going out. Uh, Cabo San Lucas is one of the greatest fishing spots in the world, I hear. I don't do a lot of fishing myself, at least not deep sea fishing. Um, but uh, tons of boats going out there. There are usually fishing tournaments here as well. Uh, so it's fun to see everybody race out when the fishing tournament starts and they uh, go off to start making their, making their money. So I am going to go. Uh, it's still way early for my breakfast. It's only 6.45 a.m. here, so I'm probably going to have to go make myself something instead of waiting for the restaurants to open. So have fun. Have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe and healthy out there, and I'll see you all at the next office hours.